welcome to our South Campus and everyone who is watching online. I am excited about today's topic and message. We're in the mental health series called Matters of the Mind. Here's what I'm going to tell you. This is part eight, I believe. Yes, it's part eight. This message today and next week are more important than any of the other seven messages we've preached on. Now, I like them. But I'm saying these are the most important to living healthy mentally. Okay, we've been talking about a lot of issues and, and challenges that we face. But we're going to talk about mental health, not as a subject, but how to be mentally healthy. What does it mean to be mentally healthy? We all understand physical health, that if we eat right, get plenty of rest, uh, we, we, we get our vitamins, we exercise, we avoid the contaminants, that we're going to have a healthy body. But so many times we forget about taking care of our mind and our brain and having a healthy brain. If I could put it this way, if your mind was a muscle, is it a muscle couch potato? Is your mind lazy and just says, you know what, I'm just going to think about whatever I want to think about today because I just don't really feel like exercising and being disciplined and controlling and, and guarding and protecting and defending my mind. I'm just going to let whatever wants to come in, come into my mind. I'm just going to let it just be what life is. Because that's the way a lot of people live. And it becomes very dangerous and it becomes very damaging. So we're going to talk about mental strength. We're going to talk about mental discipline. And we want you to be mentally muscular toned. We want you to not be a sloppy and lazy brain. We want your brain to be sharp and disciplined and buff. Anybody want a buff brain? Okay. I don't know how you're going to do that, but I'm going to help you. All right. Here's some interesting thoughts that science tells us about the mind. Research indicates that the average person has approximately 50,000 thoughts per day. 50,000 thoughts per day. Neuroscientists say that every thought sends electrical and chemical signals throughout your brain, ultimately affecting every cell in your body. So our thoughts influence our sleep, our digestion, our pulse, our chemical makeup of our blood, and so many other bodily functions. And what happens is when we persistently think about a certain area, it crystallizes into the words we speak and ultimately the things that we do. And here's, here's a big wake-up call. Today's thoughts are a 90% repeat of yesterday's thoughts. So you see, if you get in a, in, a, in, a, in a downward cycle, in a negative train heading down the track, you're going to repeat that cycle over and over again unless you steer really hard to turn that ship around. Mental health is defined as it includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, how we feel, how we act. It also helps us determine how we handle stress and how we relate to others and how we make choices in our lives. I would tell you that ultimate mental health can be described with one word, and that one word is joy. Because out of that joy comes contentment, peace of mind, confidence, a healthy self-image, a sense of well-being, an inward happiness and fulfillment, and freedom from inward pain, discouragement, and fear. We are filled with joy. Now look at the definition of joy. It's the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or the prospect, watch this, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. So I can get excited that I already know, my wife has already told me, we are going for Mexican food after the third service today. <laughs> I'm a happy man. The prospect of possessing what one desires, tacos, is already, I, I already have joy. You say, do you have tacos? I don't have tacos. But I already have joy because I know tacos are coming. This is scriptural, people. 
Because what is faith? Faith is acting like you have something and having the joy of the Lord before you see it, feel it, taste it, or touch it, that you believe that it is coming under you because your wife didn't tell you it was coming. The Father, the creator of the heavens and the universe said it's coming. And his word is way better than Kim's word. And so I know that I have the promises that God's word declares. And so it's a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. That joy comes from knowing what is coming, from what I'm experiencing and what is coming. And so what happens is a lot of people are looking for that fulfillment, that inward satisfaction. And they're trying sex, they're trying drugs, they're trying, they're trying uh, finances and careers and power, and they're finding, trying to pursue it through all of these things in the world. And where real joy comes from is from the heart of the man, from a relationship with God. And that joy is birthed from the inside out. Now, I want to share with you how do we get there, how do we live mentally healthy and of course scripture has the answer open in your bibles to philippians chapter 4 follow along on your notes with me follow along on the screens with me these few verses in philippians chapter 4 will set you free and will muscle up your brain to the to the level that god desires it to be it says in philippians 4 verse 4 always everybody say always always, always be full of joy in the lord I'm going to say it again because I don't think you guys get it or you understand it. That's what Paul's really saying. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I'm going to say it again. You people, Dean Hawk needs to rejoice. We need to rejoice and let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. These trials, these problems in the scope of eternity are minuscule. Remember the Lord is coming. This is not the epitome of your life. There is a heaven. There is a day of reward. There is a millennium of ruling and reigning with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a small but, but insignificant part of life that seems so massively significant. But in the scope of eternity, it's a smidgen. Let's keep reading. Listen to this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I'm going to say it again. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Jesus said, in Matthew 6, I believe it is, he said, he said worrying will not add one cubit to your life. It, it won't add one day. It won't extend your life. It won't make your life better in any way, shape, or form. But James chapter 5 says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man, a righteous woman has great and wonderful results. So you have a choice. I can worry about everything and pray about nothing or I can worry about nothing and pray about everything. I'm going home. Because that's better than your acting. Whew. Help him, Jesus. Watch this. Watch this. Here's where joy comes from. Here's where mental health comes from. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Amen. God, I, I really need you to do this. God, you see, I've got this bill over here and I don't have enough money. God, you see, I got this doctor's report right here and it's really not looking real good. And God, I've got this relationship conflict and I, I, don't, I don't know how to handle it. And, and, and Lord, I, I'm really in need. I really need a new place to live because the, the, the owners of a house we're renting are coming back and we need a place. And so God, I, I really tell God what you need Amen. and thank him for all he has done. Amen. What is it saying? Amen. Act joyful even when you can't see the answer. Because then, verse seven says then, when you tell God what you need and you act as though you already have it, then here's what happens. You will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Verse eight. Here's where it's going to get, it's going to get, it's going to get thick. 
And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true. How many of us know we're inundated with lies? Fix your thoughts on what is honorable. Fix your thoughts on what is right. Fix your thoughts on what is pure. Fix your thoughts on what is lovely, on what is admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That is the prescription for mental health. If it doesn't fit in here, you say eviction. You're out of here. Look what it says in the Amplified. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them, and I like this, and implant them in your heart. You see, every thought is a seed, and what you allowed to plant in your life will determine the future of where your life ends up. Let's go on to verse 9. Keep putting into practice, Paul says, all that you learned and you received from me. The things I've just told you, I remind you, again, rejoice in the Lord. Be full of joy. And again, I'm going to tell you, rejoice. And remember everything you heard from me and saw me doing. You saw me live this. Then the God of peace will be with you. This prescription for our thought life is based upon whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and worthy of praise. How much could it change our life if we applied Philippians 4, 8 and started exercising that and would not allow anything else to inundate our mind? No negative thinking. I'm not talking about denying we have a problem. I'm not talking about denying that there is a situation that needs to be dealt with. What I am telling you is we are going to take control about our thought life. We are going to have what I would call a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because here's what, here, let me show you how the negative works. You have a thought. You, you stink. You're a loser. You can't do it. You're not good enough. You're not tall enough. You're not fast enough. You're not smart enough. You're, you, there's other people that are better than you. And you start to think that way. And when you start to think that way, you start to believe that way. And when you start to believe that way, you start to self-talk and self-prophesy that way. Yeah, I'm not any good. I'm not, I don't know how to pastor. I can't grow a church. I don't know why people come and hear me. I just don't understand. And you start to speak that way. And all of a sudden, you start to act that way. And I don't know that anybody that's going to come and hear somebody say, Hey, I don't know, man. world's tough. Good luck. <laughs> I'm struggling, man. Just, just, you know, give it your best shot. You know, <laughs> let's just go be with Jesus. I don't think anybody's going to come and listen to that. And my church would, str- would shrink and everybody would go, man, I don't know what happened. I can tell you what happened. It started with the seed of a thought in my brain that said, you're no good. You're not good enough. You're this, you're that, you're that, you're that, you're that. And then you think you're, I'm such a prophet. I told you that was going to happen. Yeah, Nelly Negative, because you prophesied it would happen. (laughs) What if we changed our thought patterns? Negative thoughts don't come from God. It says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and intimidity, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. That we control the thoughts that invade us. So if you're taking notes this morning, right thinking is a choice. Right thinking is a choice. We must decide what we're going to allow to be planted in our brains and and what we're going to allow our minds to focus on. Whose report are we going to believe? Are we going to believe what the Word of God declares? Are we going to believe what the circumstances and the world around us is saying? Are we aligning our thoughts according to God's Word? If it came natural... If it was just natural to think positive, if it just came natural, Paul wouldn't have had to have written this several thousand years ago. But we are all inundated with the attacks and the, and the battlefield of the mind. And we have to control and guard our minds and what we will think on and what we will allow. You see, our culture is bent on the neg- highlighting the negative. 
It's a part of our culture. You, if, if I ever have a zillion dollars, I am going to start the GNN network, the Good News Network. And 24 hours a day, you can turn it on, and it's a story of generosity. It's a story of people helping people. It's a story of acts, random acts of kindness. And it is just story after story. Kind of like CNN and every other, name them. Even Fox News people has <laughs> negative news. Okay? It's like, well, this is bad, and this has gone bad, and these people said this, and they're bad, and bad, bad, bad. And you watch the highlight of the local news. This person was shot. This person did this, and this person, you know, attacked this person. This person drove their car. It never starts with, hey, today, someone gave $10,000 to help kids that are homeless. Never starts with good news. Even the weather people are negative. <laughs> What's this? They don't say 80% chance of rain today or 80% chance of sunshine today. No, they're negative. Well, mostly sunny, but there is a 20% chance of rain. <laughs> they ruin it. Today, it says, it doesn't say 90% chance of sunshine today. It says there is a 10% chance of rain I'm watching, I'm watching the network that starts changing their, their weather channel to, to say, hey, look at the weather. It's a 30% chance of sunshine today. <laughs> so that means it's going to rain. Yeah, but I'm optimistic. It's 30% of the day it's going to be sunshiny. And then your kid comes home with three A's, two B's, and a C. And what do we as a parent get all bent over backwards about? What's the C about? I told you if you'd finish. Why don't we rejoice on the A's and the B's? Okay? Why don't we stop picking on our husband and wife on the little things that we don't like about them and start telling them the things we do love and like about them? I bet it would change the dynamics of your relationship. James chapter 1 and verse 2 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. What is he saying? When problems come, you have a choice. You're going to worry, you're going to fret, you're going to get anxious, and you're going to be fearful, or you're going to live by faith, be joyful, be excited at what God is going to do, because this is a great opportunity, he goes on, that it's going to grow me, it's going to stretch me, it's going to strengthen me, that this opportunity is going to make me better, because look what God's going to do. And you walk by faith. And as you live that out, you see, thoughts, thoughts are like a spark from the campfire. And you're sitting there and, and, and the sparks are going, you're making sure you're not setting the forest on fire. And, and then all of a sudden a spark lands on your sweater. Here's what a lot of you do. <laughs> Honey, it's going. <laughs> a negative thought hits you a negative vibe comes at you and you start, oh yeah. And if that happened, then this could happen. And if that happened, and we start blowing, and it starts getting worse and worse. Our pinky hurts, but now we are convinced we are the first person on the planet Earth to have pinky cancer <laughs> and that we're going to die because our, our, our thoughts went uncontrolled. We have to, when, when, the, when the spark gets on your sweater, what do you do? Brush it off. You don't let it stay. You don't keep it. You don't let it, you don't let it take root. You don't let the seed be planted. You say, no, 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 no. I don't want that growing here. And you kick it out. You give it an eviction notice. I love what Pastor Furtick says this. He said, the quality of your joy cannot exceed the purity of your thoughts. Amen. Think on that one for a moment. The quality of our joy cannot exceed the purity, Philippians 4, 8, of our thoughts. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, they think on sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. In other words, the way we think determines the way we live. I'm going to help some of you out. 
it's impossible to sin without thinking about it first. See, some of you, some of you say, oh, I was just, I was walking along and I fell into sin. No, you didn't, baby. No, you took it. He said, yeah, Uh uh-huh. Yeah, 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 let's, let's go over there. Let's just pretend like we don't see it right there. Let's get as close to sin as we can. Let's get as close. You hear all the people falling off the Grand Canyon? I mean, come on, people. But that's the way most Christians are. How close can I get to the edge of sin without falling in? We need to guard the thoughts of our mind. Let's go on to the next verse, verse 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace, joy, self-contentment. Point number two, we have to shift from random reactive thinking to deliberate purpose-driven thinking. We have to take control of our thoughts. And so here's the reality. We will no longer be held hostage to our thoughts, but we will take our thoughts hostage. How are we going to do that? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. We break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself up against the wisdom of God. We take hold of every thought and make it obey Christ. I love the, the new, the Passion Translation. It says, we capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Does this thought line up? Does this, is this line up with the character of God? Is this thought in line with whom God says I am and what God says I can do? Or is this thought meant to steal, to kill, and destroy? We have to regulate our thinking. I have this thing in my house, it's called a thermostat. And I have seen on Facebook everyone in Colorado who's turning their heat back on, and it's summertime. But what are we doing? We're regulating the temperature in our home by the thermostat. We have to regulate the thoughts in our mind by setting the thermostat according to Philippians 4, 8 and not according to the ways of the world and the circumstances that are around us. Think about this. You cannot worry. You cannot, you cannot worry without thinking worrisome thoughts. You cannot be afraid without thinking fearful thoughts. It's impossible. You can't, you can't be afraid. If, if I change the course of my thinking, do you ever have that one where you, you can't get your kids? It's late at night, and they're not answering their phone, and they're not responding to a text, and, 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 and there is like 120 seconds of wig out moment. Where, where, where are they? Why, why won't they respond? They know, they know it's me. What, what, what is going on? And in 120 seconds, you have convinced yourself they're in a ditch, they've gone through the windshield because I told them to wear their seatbelt and they didn't. You, your mind is just exploding. Control your thoughts. What are the facts that I know? And what does the Word of God say? And we live and we walk in that power and we walk in that ability. And so we choose to overcome you see, does anybody watch CSI? Hit me with a CSI moment. Here's CSI, okay? I just want to know, why, why do they have the flashlights? Why don't they go flip and turn the lights on? I would be like, hey boss, flip, you can put your little binky away. <laughs> Right? Okay, I just, I'm just curious about that. But it's like our thought lives. Hit me with the dark one more time there, Eric. I can choose, I can choose to focus on her. Oh, I'm losing battery now. Oh, I'm blinking. There we go. Or I, I can choose to focus on the problem or on the answer. 
I have to decide which one I'm going to focus on. I don't deny the problem is there. I choose to focus on the answer though. I don't deny that I, I have some situations I need to deal with, but I'm choosing to focus on what God says. Here's, here's the reality, it's on your notes. Dwelling on our problems doesn't fix them, it simply makes us an expert on them. Doesn't fix them. So what if, we, what if we turned our worry to prayer? What if we fixed our thoughts on God, the answer? What if we regulated and, 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 and turned our thoughts towards answers and solutions? Winston Churchill said this, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity and an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So Boom. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Point number three. The fruit of our life today is the outcome of what we allowed to grow in the garden of our mind. Seeds are being scattered. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, evil thoughts, sinful thoughts, godly thoughts, pure thoughts, lovely thoughts, good reports, bad reports. Those seeds are being scattered and we have to determine what are we going to allow to grow in our garden. A couple weeks ago, I, I, a couple weeks ago, I was having a cool time in the presence of God and, and was asking God, I said, man, I don't understand. Where is this coming from? And, and where is this, this, this emotion that I'm having? And where is it coming from? And he said, let's take a walk in your garden. And we went over this little crest of the garden of my heart. And I went, where did that tree of bitterness where did that tree of unforgiveness, where did that tree of hurt and pain, I didn't know that was in my garden. I didn't, God, when did it, how did that grow there? He says, come back over here. And he showed me that as a child, some things happened in my life that I allowed that seed to stay. And for years and decades, it grew and now it was manifesting in my life and I didn't know why go back to your garden something was planted that needs to be uprooted of course I'm a lumberjack <laughs> I took that puppy down like we didn't wait it was I'm not gonna you need to forgive no we forgive bam it's down I'm going to cut that thing out. Luke chapter 6, verse 43, Jesus said, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree, can I insert a bad mind, can't produce good thoughts. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from the thorn brushes, bushes and grapes are never picked up from the bramble bushes goes on a good person brings good things from the treasury of a good heart do your homework the greek word comes up and it's really the thoughts or feelings referencing the mind that was translated heart now hit me back and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart mind thoughts what you say flows from what is in your heart Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he in behavior and one who manipulates. In Proverbs 4, 23, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Now, I know we're almost out of time here, and you guys are going to make an easy transition, but i got to finish this and get this in. James chapter 1 and verse 13. Check this out. When you are tempted, don't ever say, God is tempting me. For God is incapable of being tempted by evil, and he would never be the source of temptation, especially to his kids. Instead, it is each person's own desires and, say it, thoughts that drag them into evil and lure them away into darkness. It is the thoughts of our mind that leads us to that place. Let's keep reading. It says, evil desires give birth to evil actions, evil desires, evil thoughts. And when sin is fully mature, it can murder you. So my friends, don't be fooled by your own thoughts or desires. I love the way the Message Bible puts it. Here's the way it says, the temptation to give into evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up 
of our own lust. Lust gets pregnant. Remember the seed? And has a baby, sin. And sin grows up to adulthood and becomes a real killer. It starts with our thoughts. It starts with what we allow to stay in our mind. So you've heard of how to train your dragon? You've seen that? Today, I'm going to wrap this up, how to train your brain. Okay? How do you train your brain? It's on your notes. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior of the customs of the world, but let God transform you into the new person by changing the way you think will change your life. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Our future is not determined by our past. Our future is determined. The roadmap to our future is the thoughts that we allow in our mind today will be our roadmap on tomorrow's. So here's what we're going to have you do. I call these the Philippians 4, 8 questions. Five questions that you must give five responses to before you lay your little head down to rest before you go to sleep tonight. You're going to fill these in. What are five things I am grateful for right now? We're going to learn to be thankful and joyful. What are five of my strengths and positive traits? If I said jot down your negative and jot down what you're not good at, you're like, yeah, let me warm up. But what are five of my best achievements so far? Who are the five people who love me the most? Now the enemy will come and tell you who at your workplace doesn't like you, who doesn't appreciate you, what relative you're not going to get a Christmas card from. But who are the five people that love me the most? And number five, what are five things I am looking forward to in the next seven days? You're going to write down 25 things. And here's what you're going to do. Watch this. You're going to fill this piece of paper out. If I find this on the floor, I remember where you were sitting and I will hunt you down. <laughs> you're going to take this home. You're going to fill it out. Before you go to sleep, you're going to read through it. When you wake up in the morning, before you check your email, before you check your Twitter, your Facebook, or any other account, you're going to pull this piece of paper up and you're going to read through these five things that I'm grateful for, the five strengths and positive traits, and you are going to begin to retrain your brain to think positive, to think joyful, to think in accordance with God's Word. And tomorrow at lunch, you're going to read these when you're having your lunch. Tomorrow night when you go to bed, you're going to read these. And you're going to begin to retrain. You're going to do this not just for a day, not just for a week. You're going to make this a part of your lifestyle. What am I thankful for? What am I joyful for? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to get everything out of your hands. I, want, I need you to be hands free. You might, be, you might come from a Baptist, Lutheran background where, where you know, Worshiping God is like, praise the Lord. <laughs> We're going to ask you to go Pentecostal charismatic right now, everybody. Just what, whatever you are, you're going this way. Now watch. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your hands in the air like this. I'm going to count to three. And I want you to think of the biggest challenge, the biggest problem, the biggest heartache, the biggest situation that you have that you're dealing with right now. And I'm going to, when I count to three, you're going to act like you have the tacos now. You're going to act like you have the healing now. You're going to act like the prayer answer was just delivered and the angel is waiting right outside. For 10 seconds, you're going to leap, jump, shout, scream. Praise the Lord, give God praise, give God glory, because you're going to live it by faith and you're not moved by what you see. On the count of three, I'm going to count to 10 seconds and I'm going to go slow and you are going to lift the roof off of this place for 10 plus seconds. Are you ready? Here we go. Act like you already have it. Release some joy on the inside. I heard this, fake joy is better than real depression. So some of you are like, I'm just going to fake it, man. Just do it. Faith it. Don't fake it. Faith it. Here we go. On three. Here we go. One, two, three. Rejoice.
get you goosebumps. <laughs> Father, thank you for the joy of the Lord that fills and overflows these people. You're the God that is more than enough. Well, show yourself real to them as they extend their praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads up, eyes open, everybody looking around. You know what's coming. If you don't have joy in your life, if you don't know what it is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if God is just the big God in the sky and He's not your heavenly Father, today is the day to say, God, I surrender. God, I want joy, pure, uncut joy to live and dwell on the inside of me. I'm going to count to three. You don't have to jump and shout. You don't have to scream. All you got to do is lift one hand up. I'm going to make it easy for you. You just got to lift one hand up and say, I need Jesus. I need the Father's love. Amen. On three, raise your hand really high. Here we go. One, two, three. I need it. There's one right there. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hey, thanks so much for watching. I hope the Word of God is changing your life and you're being blessed and ministered to by participating in our services and enjoying the sermons that you see here online. If by chance that you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you take a moment right now and repeat this prayer with me and take that leap of faith and put your trust in God. Pray with me now. Dear loving God, thank you for the gift of your son Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for my sins. And I invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for saving me and loving me in Jesus' name. And just like that, you're adopted into the family of God. If you live in Colorado Springs or are going to be in the area, we invite you to join us at one of our two campuses. Our Woodman campus is at 4005 Lee Vance Drive. That is at the Woodman and Rangewood intersection. And our South Campus is located at 262 South Academy. Join us at either one of those locations. Check the website for service times. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.